Do you believe in love out of love? I need it, need it, I really don't think I'm in a hell. Do you believe in love out of love? And I believe that this podcast is super awesome. And I'm Leia, and I value being a good person. Cool. <laughs> and, and you're, you're tuning, tuning into the, the Lamont and Leia podcast. <laughs> so, guess what, Leia? What, Lamont? We have a returning guest. Do we? Yes. John Pearson from episode 10, The Power of Identity. I remember him. (laughs) And if you also remember, disclaimer, John is a very, he loves Christ with all his heart. Mm -hmm. He has a personal relationship. So if religion, Christ, spirituality, Things of those natures just really disturb your spirits. It is okay to skip this podcast and join us next week. But if you're okay with that or you want to listen anyway, let's go get John. Let's get him. John, we are so glad to have you back with us today. Can you please reintroduce yourself to our listening and viewing audience? Well, Lamont, my name is John Pearson, live in Lexington, Kentucky. My wife calls this the uh, most beautiful place in the world. And I um, uh, have a business, uh, it's a Christian ministry, and our goal is to help others become who God created them to be. So I'm still in a launch phase with that. Um, And so on, I play guitar, love heavy metal, and I love acoustic stuff. I'm a cross between nice, gentle, soft, easy listening and in your face, screaming, heavy metal stuff. Um, So on. So Marie and I have been married for six years. I've published a few books and so on and so on. So gives you a little idea who I am. Uh, Just make sure that you guys check out the description. We'll have all of John's links and everything in the um, down bar or if you're listening in the show description box on the screen um yeah go ahead and check all this stuff out and we will make sure everything's in there maybe even a few extras that we might have missed i don't know there'll be a bunch of stuff so check it out all right just to give you guys a little bit of background um john i met in a um room one of the groups on facebook and he was very interested in coming on the Lamont Lay show. He was here, I want to say, in episode 10. Was yeah. it? Yeah, episode 10. And we talked about the power of identity. And then, but before that, like, so, like, he gave us a long list of, like, just things that Lay and I could, like, go off of. And as we're going to be talking about beliefs and values. So I hope you guys enjoy and let's go ahead and get into the topic. So the first question I came up with was, what is the simplest way we could define beliefs and values? But to make it a little bit more fun, (laughs) I think we should flip a coin. And I don't have the coin ready. I meant to have the coin ready. Come on. John, do you have a coin on you? You're wearing it around your neck. It kind of. Kind of. Um, okay. Come on, you got to be prepped for the gag. I know. I know. I know. I totally meant to have it. And I'm just like, right, my head running around with my head cut off. Let well, me so let's do an alternative. All right. Whoever's birthday is closest to today. Does that work? Oh, okay. okay. So... Let's start with defining. Is it yours, Lamont? I think it is mine. mine John, when's your birthday? What day in August? 24. Ah, mine's the 21st. Cool. So, John, do you want to start with (laughs) beliefs or do you want to start with values? (laughs) Um, Wow. I believe we should start with values. All right. 
right, let's start with values. Okay. So what do you think, Lamont? Uh, it, from your perspective, you, you guys pick topics that you think have an interest. So I'm curious what you think values are, how you would define them. I don't want to flip the script on you, but I, I really just was kind of curious. Yeah, no problem. So if I was to explain values in its simplest form, I would say it's what you think is important or what is important to you. Mm -hmm. Yep. What matters to you? Yeah, that's pretty much what I was going to say, too. Yeah. All right. Wow. That's a scary thought. All three of us are thinking alike today. Have the planets aligned <laughs> again? Must have. Possibly. Must have. <laughs> All right. So that leads us to beliefs. Like, how would we define beliefs in the simplest, most basic um, definition? A belief is something that you think is true, that you think is absolutely true. Is That's just off the top of my head, but I haven't okay. really thought about it, but. Because when like, you believe yeah. something, I mean, you really, you think it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I Whether it is like... true or not, so relevant. That's yeah. true. That's true. Um, I feel like a lot of people just put like beliefs and values in one sort of like thing. Like, uh, so like, what is, what is really the difference? Because I'm not sure a lot of people know what the difference between it is. We kind of just lump it all together when we do like talk about this kind of stuff and it is hard to separate them out i as i've thought about this topic i've been kicking you, know, you gave me an extra couple of weeks to think about it thank you so i um, <laughs> um i i really it's like the chicken and the egg are values rooted in beliefs or are beliefs rooted in values and which one comes first and where do they come from you know, and so I, I think they are pretty well intertwined. Um, mm -hmm. They're interdependent. But I, I last night, I was thinking about the fact that if you want to know what somebody values, start taking stuff away from them. And the only experience I've had where that was really clear was I came home one night, and there was a fire truck in front of my house and there were firemen in my house, in my bedroom. I could see them upstairs in my bedroom. And I had $10,000 worth of music equipment in that bedroom. And my heart sunk because fire is unforgiving. Stuff yeah. can get wet and survive. With fire, it's just, it's unforgiving. And my heart sunk and it turns out um, I shared a house with my sister and brother-in-law. It turns out that the house had been hit by lightning oh, wow. and it went down the post in the corner of the house to the ground. And then it caught the post on fire at ground level and it started burning back up the corner of the house. And the firemen got to it before it engulfed the whole house. I mean, it, we had damage, but it wasn't bad. And the only loss I suffered was uh, I had some musical equipment in a closet and, you know, the firemen were so cool. When they went in, they covered as much stuff with plastic as they could before they started spraying anything. And I thanked them for that. And the guy said, well, if it's my house, he says, I'd want somebody to protect my stuff too from water. But they, um, the only casualty of it was a violin that my mother had given me. And they, uh, they were so afraid that the fire was going to get to the roof. And they were five feet away from the roof in my closet. He, he, they just started throwing stuff out of the closet and the violin got stepped on and uh, broken. It was irreparable. But, um, but you know, if you want to know what people value, when you start taking things away from them, the, the more they value something, the harder they're going to fight to keep it. That's a really good um, uh, example, actually. Yeah. yeah. I never thought yeah. of it like that. Um, but I guess that's why people usually like just lump them together because they are so intertwined. Yeah. yeah. So Leia, like I like, like you're saying, it's so intertwined. Like it's so hard, right? So I'm thinking if it's so intertwined, there's probably a reciprocal 
relationship between values and beliefs. Go on. Yep, I was going to say expand. (laughs) All right. So reciprocal is like, it means it goes back and forth. So like, um, I would hope that many of us have reciprocal relationships where we're getting what we need and we're giving also, right? And it's a back and forth. And it, like, I, it does one thing and it impacts the other in a great way. Well, you know, um, another way to, to talk about how to identify values is to look at somebody's use of time and look at somebody's use of money. Okay. Because people always invest those two things in whatever they value the most. And the sad thing is, sometimes people value absolutely nothing because they spend their money frivolously and they spend their time even more frivolously. I mean, people really don't understand that money is the only, or um, time is the only real currency you have in this world. And you trade time for everything else that you have in your life. You trade it for money, you trade it for relationships, you trade it for possessions, you trade it for everything. Time is all that you really own besides your body. And the sad thing is most people don't value their time. They don't value life. Um, And they don't think about what they do with it. But beliefs, I think, um, you know, as I've thought about these two things, it really is, I've never really tried to define them before, but beliefs being things that you think are true, those can evolve separately from values because we get exposed to all kinds of thinking. And I think that Um, I don't know if this is a fair statement, but I've come to think that beliefs are more of an intellectual process and values are more of an emotional process. Hmm. I would agree with that. Yeah, I can agree with that too. It makes sense. So Lamont, as I thought about values and beliefs in the past, I've wondered at times, why is it so hard for people to let go of values and beliefs right especially when they know for sure something's just plain wrong so if you picture a circle and then a circle out a little bit another circle and another circle and so on you have in the middle core values or core beliefs and then based on those if you go out one layer you build other values or beliefs on those values or beliefs and then when you go out in another circle you base those on the second circle and so on. And so when you get out to somebody's outer values and beliefs, they don't have a lot of, of stock in those. I mean, those are things that they let go of easily. You know, they'll let somebody win the argument over, you know, do we eat rye bread or wheat bread, right? right. No big deal. They might like, you know, wheat bread better, but they don't fight over that. But the closer you get down to the core, the more people fight over those because if you let go of a core value, there's a domino effect out through all of the other layers that they recognize there's a whole chunk of stuff that goes when this goes. And so um, um, that's why I think people fight. And then even if people know that a belief is wrong or something, an example that's that helps people understand would be a battered woman who stays in a relationship because she values being in relationship. She, Mm -hmm. she really wants that and values it above her own safety and well being. And so she stays in that situation and then she has a whole bunch of behaviors, you know, values it a bit on it. Like she has to protect another value would be, I have to protect the person that's um, abusing me because I don't want to lose this, even though they're abusing me. They believe that the abuse is justified because of whatever reasons and so on like that. So, Yeah, that's another thing I hadn't really thought about before. Like, you know, some some values are more like core, like you said. And yeah, if you were to like get rid of a core value, then things that it's based on would kind of like just fall apart. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. He's always bringing stuff to the table, man. (laughs) (laughs) Well, as I said before, you guys inspire me to greatness. (laughs) Um, 
Oh, I'm glad you blinked your eyes, Lamont. I thought you froze up again. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> um, He's doing some thinking. <laughs> yeah. So I'm kind of thinking like, so where do these core beliefs come from? Where do beliefs come from? Mm-hmm. Like, how do they develop? Yeah. I can take that one. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that, Leia? Um, so I've always, not, I shouldn't say always. But in my adult always (laughs) um, have always been under the impression that your the things that you believe can change over time, depending on where you live, your experiences and whatnot. Um, So an example, like a personal example for me would be um, a diet. So growing up, uh, I mean, we didn't have the best diet. Um, so, you know, diet wasn't very important to me, but as I got older, look into nutrition, look at my own personal health, try to improve my health. Um, diet has now become very important to me. Um, and so that's just changed over time with my experiences. Um, and I can't think off the top of my head now that I'm talking, uh, Mm um, like more examples, like and I would say, Leah, that you now value nutrition. Mm-hmm. Right. You value, and it's, you don't value nutrition. You value yourself. You value your health. Yes. Therefore, you say nutrition. And this is a case of a core value. You value health. And then you go out a little bit and it's like, okay, because I value health, now I have to value nutrition. And I believe that nutrition is important to my life because I value health. And so now if you took that health core value and started looking at all of the things around that, um, you may value exercise or believe that you need to exercise. Whether you want to exercise or not, you may say, I just got to go do this because of that core value. And you're right, as we yeah. mature, our values change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, Kids change. When you have kids, it mm-hmm. changes a whole bunch of values and beliefs you have everybody's an expert at parenting until they have kids and then everybody around them's an idiot (laughs) especially all of the people that have never had kids like well you never dealt with this yeah and i'm watching um my stepdaughter amy she's got a two and a half year old right now and uh, she is navigating that age of her daughter very well but it's a very challenging thing to do um and then once I, I was watching some a group of mothers, and I could tell you based on how they were handling their kids, whether it was their first kid or their fourth or fifth kid, because a, a parent with a new, you know, a first baby, they're afraid they're going to drop them, they're afraid they're going to break them, they're afraid something's going to happen to them. By the time they get to the fifth kid, they're like, dude, if you drop them, they bounce and they cry, <laughs> and then they're okay, you know. <laughs> they just learn that kids are a lot more durable than they think they are you know Mm -hmm. wow so like i do think you kind of answered like the question where do beliefs come from they come from our experiences or experiments right they come from the acceptance of cultural and societal norms and they come from what other people say where we're getting our education from our mentoring right so beliefs are essentially ideas that we hold true and we then assign value so i would i like so not to say what comes first the chicken or the egg because again i think it's reciprocal and it can happen simultaneously but i think beliefs in general are ideas that we come up with and we then assign value but it's all happening like super fast at the same time. Yep. And it isn't necessarily things we come up with. You know, it's things that we, through, like you said, life experience or exposure to knowledge, we just come to settle in on and we think this is true, you know? And there's different kinds of beliefs. I mean, we, right. you know, scientists, they, uh, they have a set of beliefs based on empirical things and they investigate and so on. Um, But relationally, you know, what you believe about another person, um, 
is something that is developed over time because it, it takes time to get to know the person. And all of us start life out believing everybody around us is pretty much good. You know, when we're little children, we trust a whole lot of people that aren't trustable because yeah. we haven't we haven't been burned. But we believe people are good, everybody, and we don't have our prejudices yet. We are all just open books and people are people and, you know, we like talking to them or we hide from them or, you know, whatever it is. And then as we mature, uh, we're exposed to different kinds of thinking. We're just exposed to different cultures and those things. And all those things do shape our thinking and our belief. And some of it's a slow burn, you know, like I was a part of a church that um, was more evangelism oriented than I am and very open to things. And I look back now, you know, 17 years, I changed just because of being a part of that church. I have a different perspective on people. And I think different, like they assumed that the people that came to church for the first time knew absolutely nothing about Christianity or the Bible. They, they said they're at ground zero. And so the way that they would talk about faith was very different. The, the words they used, the, the way that they uh, presented concepts about Christianity were really different than what you would find in a church that um, assumes everybody's already a Christian and has some Bible knowledge and stuff. I mean, they would even tell people, you know, they, they had Bibles they gave out to people and they would tell them what page number to look for rather than what chapter and verse to look for because wow. they knew it was easier for somebody to find that page. And so that influenced my assumptions about people and how I present stuff. And I taught software for three years. And so those two things together, I learned that when somebody knows absolutely nothing, it takes more effort on the person presenting information to make things clear to the person so that they understand what you're saying. And, and so I, I learned to be more concise, have more clarity and stuff like that. Um, John, as you were talking, um, this like like this thing just popped into my mind. Like values and beliefs can be dangerous. Yeah. Example. Example. Okay. There. Um, oh, you have one. Yes. Okay. At one time in our history, the masses believed the world was flat. <laughs> And they killed philosophers who said the world was round. They so did. the belief was the world was flat. And the value was this is absolutely right. And everyone has to believe this. And if you don't believe what we believe, you're the enemy. And you got to yes. go. Yep. Right. Absolutely. And so people lost their lives and they were right. <laughs> they were right. The yep. world was round. So depending on what we believe, it can be harmful. Yep. That stuff's still going on today, Lamont. Um, and people, um, it's really sad that, that people blindly believe things. And, and it gets back, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Myers-Briggs on how yes. people gather information you gather information either through sensory things or intuition, and then you process information either through thinking or feeling. And um, I, I might have mentioned this last time, you know, I was a part of a group, um, a small group leaders ministry, and they were trying to help people understand the Myers-Briggs. And so when we came to the thinking and feeling part, they said, everybody that's a thinker, go to one side of the room and everybody's a feeler, go to the other side. And I was half and half. So I went with the feelers. And they said, here's a decision that you have to make. You have a girls softball team that has 14 girls on it. You now have won enough games that you're in the tournament, um, the regional tournament, and you have to drive to Florida for the regional tournament. And they tell you that you can only have 11 girls listed on the roster for the game. So how do you decide which 11 girls out of the 14 get to go to Florida? immediately on the feeling side of the room, there was a collective, oh, everybody was like, what do you mean? And, and so I, I listened to all these 
these feeling people talk about, well, no, all 14 girls are going. They were part of the team, et cetera, et cetera. And then they gave us like 20, 30 minutes to process this and then come back together and say, okay, what's, how did you resolve this? And all the thinkers were like, well, we looked at batting averages. We looked at, you know, all of the stats, you know, everything like that. What's the best team we can field with 11 girls? Who's the best 11 girls? All the fielders just said, all 14 girls are going. They get to play in the game. We don't care what the rule is. We, we're not saying no to anybody. And so um, as I've looked at politics over the last five or eight years, in, the, in our political climate, as I've observed the two major parties, and, and I'll just pick the immigration stuff that, you know, when Trump came into office, you know, all of the immigration stuff hit the fan, right? And I was listening to both sides of the conversation. I have some very hardcore conservative friends and some very hardcore liberal friends, progressive friends. And so I was listening to both sides of the conversation. And I came to the conclusion that one, both sides had incredible ideas and needed to be listened to by the other side. I, th I thought that if we took the best of both sides, we would come up with an incredible uh, immigration policy. And, and I realized neither side was listening to each other. In fact, I coined, or I started thinking the thought, everybody's yelling so loud, I can't hear what they're saying, right? And, uh, but the other side of it was too, that I realized that the conservatives were much more intellectual about how they were approaching things. They were looking at it through the eyes of law, through the eyes of rationality, et cetera, et cetera. Whenever I was listening to folks on the, the liberal side or watching TV, it all came down to um, emotion. Oh my God, how can you separate a mother from her child at the border? How can you, you know, how can you possibly do this? How can you possibly do that? And it was all based on heart. You know, and so um, we have head and heart. And then that plays into values, that plays into beliefs, right? Some folks evaluated things on the side of um, how it felt, how it would feel to be in the shoes of the person at the, the border trying to get into a better life versus somebody thinking about it saying, well, okay, we don't want to keep people out that want to have a better life, but we've got to be wise about, we have to think about this and, and so on. And so I saw those two competing sets of values that were based on two totally different ways of processing what's happening in the world and in life. Um, and you, and it, this kind of underscores the comment I made earlier about conflict, the values that people have, how people determine what they believe also drives what they value or what they value drives what they believe. You know, people that really, really value keeping the law and having strong laws uh, value the border situation differently than people that really value relationships and family above the law. And so those two competing things um, produce a lot of conflict or have produced a lot of conflict. This all sounds very important. <laughs> like I, I think, I think most people know that val having values and beliefs and like holding to them is important. But like, yes, why is it important? Is my question. <laughs> yeah. Like, why does it matter? Why? Like, I don't know. <laughs> and I think most people don't know why things matter to them. They just know that it does. I value honesty, right? I value truth. And so I, uh, I will argue in a positive sense, right? If you take like debate arguing where it's about presenting information and you argue a point, I, I value arguing and talking through disagreements because I'm looking for truth. Right. And I love I, I don't know if you've seen the movie Contact with Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey, where she goes off on this uh, space tr travel through a wormhole thing. But the, the theme through this whole movie is he's a he was a former priest and he was he's a spiritual advisor to the president. She's a hardcore scientist that doesn't believe in religion or God or any of that stuff. And so they, these two characters keep intersecting throughout the whole movie. And the coolest thing at the end of the movie is uh, they ask 
Matthew McConaughey, what they thought about her testimony about this experience she had that she can't explain to anybody. She just knows she had it, right? And, um, and stuff. And Matthew McConaughey said, well, he said, I always thought that science and religion were really the pursuit of truth. They just have a different way of going about it, but they're both trying to discover truth. Right. And so I, I will argue, I will have some colorful discussions with people over things because I'm trying to get to the truth of something. Not, And often I don't want to win the argument. I'm willing to change what I think. But sometimes you have to argue it through because I don't just give up things very easily because I'm, it's the way I'm wired. I hang on to what I believe and stuff unless you can really demonstrate to me that what I'm believing and thinking is just wrong. And right. you know, once I see that, I'll let it go. But I'll defend and I'll argue, um, you know, to try to get there. Right. Leah, going, going back to what you said earlier, why does any of this matter? Why is any of this important, right? Well, I think I kind of hit the head, net on the, 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 the head <laughs> on the nail when I the said... The on the hail. That, that, that. <laughs> okay the head on the head. How, how you say that that, would, that should be the like, that should be the title of this episode the, the nail on the hail <laughs> <laughs> the head on the nail right yes. head on the nail when i said um values and beliefs can be dangerous right so another example really quick salem witch trials if they believed a woman was a witch, she was drowned or burned. So many women lost their lives. So many women were not witches. But the value, the belief was, like, if, if someone was proven to be a witch, they were bad, evil, against God. The value was keeping the society, the, the culture, clean and purified, right? Um, so... I believe, I believe, <laughs> I believe it's important because we need to be able to articulate our values in order to make clear, rational, responsible, and consistent decisions. Decisions and choices that aren't hurting other people. And so when we have false beliefs or false values, we have the tendency to hurt people. So the whole like LGBT thing that we just did last month, celebrating LGBT, like growing up, it's to be gay is an abomination. To engage in that kind of like relationship is an abomination. The value is following God, right? And being pure. The belief is that these acts are sin against God. And therefore, if you sin against God, you're probably not a good person. Right, um, and so you, so there's been a whole, like in the '90s, and and even now, like there's there's all these people who are oriented that way that are told these messages, and there's so much hurt going on. So, yeah. but like then there's there's other values in the churches, right? Like love everyone, accept them where they are at. Um, bring them to Christ or just no, have no judgment. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, so <laughs> you have competing like beliefs and values going on with other ideas. And so I know for some people it's like, okay, this is so much. So let's get about down to the bare minimum. How can I be the most loving person I can? And I want to be there. And maybe that's the core value or belief so and for somebody within the church that's a core value lamont for other people holiness is a core value okay and they would argue that while god is a loving god he's also a just god he's also going to discipline people he the bible is very clear he's going to send people to hell you know and so that opens up a whole can of worms about how do we you know one of the other things I'll toss out there is um, I've been looking at the last 120, 140 years to say what's 
what has been shunned by society or what has the church tried to do over the last 120 years? What are the, the issues that generations have? And, and the interesting thing is that if you go back and look at that history, what you find is each generation has um, kind of a, a focus or a bent towards something. And right now, the, the, what drove me this is um, critical race theory and social justice and those things. So I've been investigating it, trying to understand it. What is this? And, um, and as I've gone and just looked at history about critical race theory, I'm also looking at history in terms of what are the issues that people are debating or arguing over and stuff. And it's just very interesting how it seems like every 20 years, 30 years, there is a shift in the emphasis of what people are focused on. So if you go back to um, in the 19 teens, the big push then was get rid of alcohol because all the problems that alcohol does, right? And, and they were justified in saying, if we get rid of alcohol, we get rid of a whole lot of social problems. Well, that worked for a while, but some people valued their freedom to drink so much that they kept fighting to get alcohol legalized again. And then there were other people that valued um, illegal activities to make money with, right? right? And so while alcohol was illegal, they said, well, here's our chance to make a killing, right? And so there were millions, if not billions of dollars made during prohibition. And then in the 1920s, uh, the church was fighting against evolution. That's when the monkey trial and all that stuff came out, right? And that was the big topic that the church was fighting against. But also during the 1920s, um, that was a very morally loose season of our country's history. Um, back in the 90s, I read an article that said there were more uh, children born out of wedlock in the 1920s than there had been at any other time in our, our country's history. And so uh, they didn't have birth control. So obviously wow. prostitution and all that stuff was a factor in all of that. But still, there were a lot of single parents, single women with children uh, during that time and, and sex and just partying up and everything when there was all this money flowing and, you know, it was the roaring 20s, as they called it. And then came the depression, right? And all that dried up and people's values changed. Okay, that was my parents' generation. My dad, we, you know, those popcorn pin, tins that you can buy, like popcorn at the store in that has three different flavors or whatever yeah. that are, we had six or eight of those things when I was growing up that were full of nuts and bolts just from whatever. My dad didn't throw nuts and bolts away. He kept them because he might need them, right? And there were other things that my parents just, you kept because you can't, they didn't have the money to go buy it. I mean, I read an article about a lady that uh, saved for five years to buy a $1 China plate to put in her home oh, because wow. she always wanted China and all she could afford was one plate, but she it took her five years of saving to have $1 to spend on that in the, in the great depression. And so their values were, were very different than my values. Cause when I got born, I mean, we were um, the abundance was back in society. I mean, you, you know, all kinds of stuff. But my parents, my father carried that all the way to his death. I mean, he was a miser when it came to money. He just saved. And I grew up working on cars and working on the electrical stuff in the house and the plumbing in the house because he didn't pay anybody to do anything unless he just couldn't do it or I couldn't do it. One of the two. And I remember complaining to him one day we were doing a replacing a transmission or something in a car. And I was complaining to him about my friends down the street playing football and i'd really rather be playing football than working on the car and he's like so go play football i'll fix the car but monday morning your sisters will be riding to school in the car and you'll be walking right so i i grew up working on cars now i don't work on cars i pay somebody else to work on my cars right <laughs> uh, even though i could do some of the stuff i'm paying somebody else to do because i value my time more than i value you know, saving the money and stuff. But anyway, and so as you look over history, you know, the fifties, it was the birth of rock and roll. 
and all of the sexual revolution stuff started in the 50s and you know when elvis went on stage shaking his hips i mean the whole country was up in arms over what he's doing and jerry lee lewis man you know the stuff he was doing and then he married his 13 year old cousin uh, which was legal in alabama or louisiana where he was from and yet that cost him his career when people found out about it in the 1960s it was the sexual revolution that the church was fighting with in the 60s and 70s and in the 80s the the gay stuff started coming about and then all of the uh the abortion stuff started in the 60s and so as you look over history um once again what people are afraid of losing they're willing to fight for and you can kind of see what values are by what they fight for and then in a society you see all the competing values emerge as people start trying to change the values from a to b and that's what we're seeing right now uh, with things that's why there's such a i think um there's there's confusion but i think there's also um, a push against critical race theory because people feel like they're going to lose something because people don't really know what it is as i've been investigating and it's like well, this is an academic way of thinking. The conclusions that they're coming to from the thinking is what most people are calling critical race theory, but critical race theory really as a discipline is a way of thinking about things. And it's rooted in critical theory, which got rooted back into the way Marx evaluated his society and stuff. And that's why people say it's rooted in Marxism. And then people that like critical race theory are like, well, it's not Marxist because it doesn't have any Marx. And, then you get into all this confusion. Um, but there's when the people are afraid of losing something they value, they fight for it. Um, and so on. And so that's what I think we see in our nation right now is all these competing values. And they're slowly getting rooted or people are, you know, the values are getting kind of entrenched in one side or the other with it and that's so i say with you lamont values and beliefs can be a very dangerous thing um because we're not mankind is just not able to deal with it um so I, and i'll offer a thought with that lamont to a, a christian thought uh, i believe that the bible's true and I believe that after Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, everything changed, right? And I believe that then they had the knowledge of good and evil. That's what scripture says. They now know good and evil. And so God did some things to, you know, in result of that. And so I've been contemplating the idea that, or the thought that everyone before they come to a faith in Christ only can, can make decisions based on the knowledge of good and evil. Once I come, once I came to a faith in Christ, God began to impart to me his wisdom. So now I had the knowledge of good and evil, and I have God's wisdom. The longer I walk with Christ, the more I lean into God's wisdom, and I see the wisdom of God's wisdom over the knowledge of good and evil. But I've been thinking about how, uh, asking, you know, how much of the work of the kingdom of the church is actually rooted in the knowledge of good and evil versus the wisdom of God. But then I also look at those outside the church and i and if all they have to work with is the knowledge of good and evil one of the things that i'm really recognizing is what some people call good others call evil and what yeah. some people call evil others call good yeah. and so everybody interprets good and evil differently and getting back to like i said during the prohibition years there were people that said oh okay we can use this opportunity to do something illegal to make lots of money. Some people called that evil, but they looked at it and said, no, this is good for us because this is how we function. We are lawbreakers. We know we're lawbreakers. We're choosing to be lawbreakers. We don't care about the laws. We're going to make money where money is to be made and so on. And so in all kinds of things, if you really start thinking about it, all of this conflict just comes down to people saying what's good and what's evil. And we want to keep the good and promote the good and get rid of the evil. Yeah. And society keeps changing. 
Right. Your generation, I think you guys are around 30 years old, right? Around there, yeah. Yeah. So when you guys are 63, like me, you'll be looking at people that are 30 years old and saying, what are they thinking? Where, where did this thinking come from? Because they're thinking so differently than we do. And I base that on the fact that when I was getting out of high school, uh, drugs and free sex and rock and roll and all of that stuff is what we valued. And my parents' generation was like, you guys are so irresponsible. You know, you need to get jobs. You need to go to college. You need, you know, we were in long hair. I mean, long hair on men when I was in high school was that could get you into some serious trouble, especially in some areas of the country. There were people that were had the crap beat out of them right. for having long hair, some men, right? Or women with short hair. Right. Because you didn't fit the social norms. And um, now I'm watching your generation bringing about social change upon my generation that my generation is saying, whoa, wait a minute, what are you doing? And so I'm, I'm just offering the thought that I think when you guys hit 60, 65, you're going to be looking at what's going on in society and saying, I don't agree with all this change that's taking place. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's kind of fair because of yeah. like the different, like my grandma and my mom, like their uh -huh. different beliefs. So yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, anyway. Yes. So I think, I think, the point of all of this is I think what Leia and I want most is for people to look inside, become the best versions of themselves so they know that they are treating or interacting with people in loving and supportive ways. That, that's probably a dream, but <laughs> I think that's what we want. <laughs> so saying somebody becoming the best version of themselves is really ambiguous. I, mm -hmm. I it is. It is. you to think about that um, because you did kind of clarify it, that they're loving and treating people with dignity and respect. I mean, Martin Luther King in his speech, that's basically what he said was he longed for a time when people were judged by their character rather than the color of their skin. Yes. Right. And so that's a, a, I think that's what you're saying yes. is that people have good character where they respect other people, they care about other people uh, and so on. And that's the sad part is I, I look at those outside the church and it's like, they're never going to do that. They're never going to create a just society because most people are self-centered and they're going to do what's in their best interest at the expense of others. And I really wish that we could create a just society where people really valued people more than themselves and would treat other people that way. But and it, that didn't even happen in the church most of the time. Uh, the longer I walk with Christ, the more painful it is to watch how Christians treat each other and treat people outside the church because you see that they just don't love people. They love themselves or they love something more than people which i i used to be more that way too i mean we all that's just the way we all are until god gets a hold of our hearts yeah he's still he got a hold of my heart yeah. he's done some cool stuff in me i think i think part two so <laughs> this is part one. i think part two should be like beliefs and values how do we get there <laughs> like brainstorm let's let's figure out a way to get there um but no, this has been a really good conversation. We have touched and hit on so much. And I think it is time to wrap up. Okay. So, John, I just want to say thank you so much for supporting Leia and I and joining mm -hmm. us on today's podcast. We are so happy to have you back. Yes, and I hope we have you back again. <laughs> well, thank you, Leia. Since we talked about, like, five other topics again okay. <laughs> so we'll have to bring you back for at least five more episodes <laughs> it, it's, it's such a privilege to spend time with you if you never publish this i have already i already have my reward in that i now know you guys better and i value the friendship that's growing with us and i appreciate the, the privilege of being here with you thank you <laughs> Thank you.
today's life lesson is gaining power over your own life. Steve Marabelli once said in his book, a lot of conflict you have in your life exists simply because you're not living in alignment. You're not being true to yourself. This is why we must examine our beliefs, our values, and choose what works for us and what doesn't. This is how we master ourselves and start to gain power over our own lives. And that is today's life lesson.